the Carnegie Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to uh, the third annual Indo-Pacific Islands Dialogue. Uh, welcome back, everyone, in person, and those of you are watching online. To our audience in person, thank you very much for braving the rain and to being in the room. I hope uh, you've had a warm cup of coffee or a tea and are ready for the next panel, which I personally am very uh, excited about uh, to have two uh, brilliant ambassadors to the United Nations, uh, Ambassador Elina Said, who is the ambassador and prominent representative to the United Nations from Republic of Palau, and Ambassador Margot Day, who has, is joining us virtually, uh, uh, an ambassador and prominent representative tonight to the United Nations and the International Seabed Authority from Republic of Nauru. Um, we just heard Secretary General Puna open the dialogue with conversation and his thoughts about the Blue Pacific and uh, really setting the stage on how, uh, how uh, the conversation, larger conversation both on geopolitics but as well as issues that really are front and center for the Pacific Island Forum um, and throughout, the, uh, uh, throughout uh, the small island developing states. The next panel we would, uh, we we would like to speak with both the ambassadors about from their um, role here at the United Nations, representing the nations at the multilateral level, but also being in New York um, and engagements with DC to help us provide an overview of how particularly, of course, Nauru and Palau uh, have engaged with some of the evolving geopolitical conversation, but also uh, in their engagements with the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, well, uh, before I turn to, uh, Ambassadors, just a quick note for the audience. Um, I'll have a conversation with both ambassadors and then we'll have audience Q&A in the second half of the program. To participate in the audience uh, Q&A section of the program, please use the QR code that should be on the seats next to you uh, or shared with you by our ushers and submit your questions on the fo uh, uh, form it directs you to. For those of us who's uh, uh, joining us online, please submit your questions in the YouTube chat, and we will do our best to accommodate during the Q&A portion of the conversation. Ambassador Day, thank you for joining us uh, virtually, and Ambassador uh, Said as well. It's an extremely busy week in New York with, uh, with your senior leadership in town as well, so really appreciate your time and effort, and thank you for supporting this um, initiative. Um, Ambassador Said, Taking advantage of the fact that you're here <laughs> sitting mm -hmm. with us, uh, may I turn to you to perhaps uh, offer some uh, comments or remarks on the panel on uh, islands in geopolitics and your perspective in your role at the UN before we uh, continue with the conversation. Yes, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you so much, Darshana, for, for having me and to the Sasaka um, Peace Foundation and the Carnegie um, Endowment for International Peace for, for hosting us today. So it certainly is, I think, a really interesting time in the Pacific, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, there is a, a, a kind of big geopol geopolitical uh, shift that's happening currently, and uh, the Pacific Islands um, are in an interesting position. I think we um, we're it comes with both it, its benefits and it's also risks as well. I think one of the nice things is that we now have a lot of larger countries who are interested in talking to us, um, talking to us about our uh, fights with climate change, sea level rise, specifically um, in the Pacific Islands, um, our challenges with accessing finance and meeting the SDGs. So in some ways, the uh, the geopolitics has um, allowed us to kind of have a better uh, uh, access and, and conversation with larger uh, developed countries who hopefully can help us meet some of these goals. Um, but the downside risk, of, of course, and you know, there's a lot of um, geopolitical tension and um, the things in the Taiwan Strait, for example, have been uh, at times a little bit uh, shaky. Um, and as Pacific Islands, we, most of us already have been through war. A lot of us, in Palau um, was one of the bloodiest battles in, um, the, in World War II is in Peleliu. Um, and we kind of, I think, heard from our you know, grandparents how um, 
difficult of a time war is. And so we kind of come into um, geo ge geopolitical um, tension with um, having gone through that and having gone through kind of nuclear um, testing. And so we, we, we understand that we can't quite, um, we, we wanna kind of try to um, ease the, the tension rather than escalate it. So there are very kind of um, competing forces there, but it's definitely an interesting time uh, in the Pacific. And um, our Blue Pacific strategy, which uh, you may have heard about, is um, a document that we collectively are working um, together to kind of implement what it means to work together as the Pacific. One of the uh, interesting pieces of uh, data that I, I read was the Pacific Islands are 28 million square kilometers. It's the size of China, Russia, and Peru put together. So it's actually a huge um, uh, polit uh, uh, geography. Um, and so it's, uh, I think if we work together with Pacific regionalism, we might be able to kind of uh, move a lot of our dialogue and our, um, our goals forward. So I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Said. Uh, Ambassador Jay, I wanted to turn to you to see if you might have any opening thoughts on, on this, on sort of your interactions or engagements um, on um, the geopolitical conversations uh, today, or we can go directly into the sort of, I have a few uh, a conversation uh, questions for you. Um, just wanted to check if you had any opening thoughts uh, for the panel. I'm assuming you're speaking to me, Dashana, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. So let me first of all just say thank you for in thank you so much for inviting me to speak, and also let me thank the organizers for this opportunity. Um, it's an honor to be here today, and especially with my colleague um, Ambassador, the permanent representative of Palau, Ambassador Ilana said. Apologies that I couldn't make it on on time, but if I was there, I'd have to leave early, um, based because my principal arrives actually today, so I have to make time management, just not uh, doing it via Zoom. So that's my apologies. But I, I think I think um, Ambassador Ilana suggest, uh, raised some critical points that just as an opening in terms of where we are in the ge geopolitical uh, scheme or where the Pacific lies and what's happening in the Pacific. But the, the momentum, I guess, the political momentum right now is for all of us to stand together and try to move the trajectory of the the impacts of climate is really at the forefront of some of these elements that we are going through. So to be in that position, both um, uh, as a vulnerable country exposed to uh, existential threat to climate, also being an interest for geopolitics, it, uh, gives us both an opportunity and also a, a disadvantage, if you, if you could say, if I can say that in a more broad sense, but I will kind of speak to it when I speak to the, the examples of Nauru uh, more. But I think it's these, those, these are the interesting times and we, I hope that we take as best as we could to take a, uh, a forward step rather than moving back uh, and try to meet all the goals that we're trying to achieve. And one of them is our very existence as nations and as the Pacific Islands uh, in our region. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Um, you, know, you both talked about uh, the, the attention to the region and growing sort of attention and engagement to the region. And uh, Secretary General Puna talked about uh, different competing powers uh, coming with engagement, but not necessarily all uh, exact deliverables. Um, I wanted to start with, a, uh, with one particular team to a question that I can pose perhaps to both of you. This forum particularly is an, is an effort to highlight the perspectives of island nations and to break away from the narrative of US versus China, that the region should not be viewed uh, through this great parlance. Uh, but do you think there is also a risk that this competition might be seen as an opportunity to maximize attention uh, which in the long run might harm the region with short-term commitments, because if sort of uh, talking, getting attention and maximizing the attention of two competing powers, which might result in, um, in announcing a number of series of, uh, say, initiatives, but not resulting in something concrete. So I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on the risk of, of sort of maximizing this attention as well. Maybe I can start with you, Ambassador uh, Jay, and then... Uh, come to you, Ambassador Said. I mean, I think the, the question you posed, uh, Deshana, 
for, from my perspective, as I highlighted, one of the things is we do see an opportunity, but we also hope that it doesn't disadvantage us by being the center of point of geopolitical interests and moving away like um, like our interest into our own survival. So uh, as you rightfully understood, and I think I spoke at your event in Washington, one of the critical things that um, my country has taken lead on as a co-chair, member of the co-chairs, uh, the security implications of climate change and, it, it's, and its impact. Um, and this is more or less how the UN treats the issue of uh, you know, uh, climate change, and we we're trying to make the United Nations itself fit for purpose, if and um, fit for the reality of the world we live in today. And climate change is really at the forefront, and it's become a it can be a for us it's a it has security implications, both from a national sense and from existential sense. So these are one of one thing that we my delegation has been raising. On behalf of a group, no less, but it seems that it's been missed in some some ways or some um, at the institutional level. Basically, I, I don't want to overlay the impacts that we're currently experiencing, but there's quite a lot of significant challenges that countries face. Not by myself, but mainly across the Pacific, um, that are from sea level, the rising sea and all the impacts and the adaptation, the infrastructure, um, all of these has have had impacts to each country individually and collectively as a whole. And so one of the things where we never raised, but I, I wanted to raise is one of the initiatives we carried out in Nauru has been the, it's called the Higher Ground Initiative, and it's about relocating people from low-lying coastal lands to the inland where it's higher. And there's kind of move costs nationally will cost millions of dollars to do it but it is part of the effort of safeguarding realizing what kind of reality we live in today uh, um, so this uh, is plan is kind of like a managed migration but people don't want to hear this but this is real impacts um this is where some of the elements that we discuss and then when an institution like the United Nations is not is not focused or is not really dealing with this type of implications, then we we question ourselves, what are, we, what are they doing? What's happening on the front? So that's one example that I wanted to raise really from that perspective. I can add more, but you can stop me if I'm... Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Lina, if I may turn to you on the same question of the risk of maximizing attention. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, it's a really interesting question. I think uh, I can just speak from Palau's experience in, in, I think, the last two years. We have had a lot of attention and energy from partners who normally um, haven't really engaged with us, with us before. Uh, that is both a positive thing, but it's also because we are a very small country, it's a lot of drain on resources. So they'll send, you know, foreign ministers who've never been to the Pacific and they come um, you know, country after country, and they said Sid, Sid's envoys, and as you can imagine, our foreign ministry is quite small. So the um, the capacity to actually implement any of the of these promises is is challenging. So I think one of the things in the Blue Pacific strategy um, is is uh, regionalism, like how do we collectively work together as the Pacific Islands uh, um, and and the Pacific region, um, so that there's like an appropriate channel. Um, and I think that's probably one of the key things that we need to focus on is is kind of working collectively because if we um, try to do things individually, it, it seems to kind of drain resources and, and people are kind of scattered er everywhere. And so I think in the medium to long run, that might be a challenge. Um, and so I think that's uh, specific, specifically for Palau, I've seen that to be um, a challenging thing where, uh, you know, for example, renewable energy, mm -hmm. we've had a lot of countries come and offer, um, you know, uh, funds and um, pilot projects, um, but having to navigate, you know, the 10 different offers uh, and try to put it into one executable plan mm -hmm. is pretty challenging. So um, I think if, if, we, if we kind of organize ourselves properly, I don't think it's a long run problem, but I think in the short run, if we 
just kind of take it as it comes. Um, I, I think there will be challenges with, with getting uh, a lot of things done. Thank you, thank you both. Those are some uh, really interesting perspectives on sort of the risks and the other side of getting that much of attention and particularly to what you said, Ambassador Liana, in uh, the visits to the region, which particularly this year we've seen quite a few at the, uh, at the leadership level from multiple countries at the summit level, which yeah. takes up a lot of resources. And the question that often comes out is, uh, you know, what has been the deliverables of it? So uh, really appreciate you both bringing out these uh, really specific uh, aspects and perspective of it, because sometimes sitting in DC, you don't necessarily hear the perspective of what is it doing in the region and you see this is oh, this is great it's, there's so much attention to the region uh, and and sort of borrowing from that or, or continuing on that thread um, um, it, both of you represent your nations at the highest level of uh, multilateral negotiations um, however many of the institutions organizations uh, designed to address some of the pressing challenges of the day are not necessarily equipped to um, address challenges important to particularly island nations, uh, and we've seen that in the, in the aspect of climate conversation. Um, can, you, can you talk a little on specific areas that you think uh, in your role at the UN requires attention to start delivering on issues that are front and center for island nations? And Ambassador Lina, maybe I'll start with you. Sure, yeah. Um, from one of the things I am most vocal about, and I, I, I've, put, I've been putting a lot of my time in, is accessing climate finance. Mm -hmm. um, SIDS are, we all know SIDS are the most vulnerable country group. Um, we have access, because our teams are so small and the multilateral institutions that were created have very complicated mm -hmm. systems and data requirements, it's very hard for small islands to access, for example, the Green Climate Fund. Um, so in our efforts to try to transition to renewables, that's been a, an incredible challenge. I, I, I keep using the example, um, Palau, it took five years to get a concept um, application through the Green Climate Fund, and that's, it's, you know, by the time, mm -hmm. if you start a concept note and five years later it goes through, the technology is probably no longer, you know, what you should be using anyway. So I think um, working with the multilateral institutions to fix those uh, blocks um, so that they're fit for purpose, I think is uh, a key thing. Um, and yeah, I think I, I, that's kind of, you know, the rel relative scheme of things, it, it's very hard to do anything without financing. So adaptation funding, for example, SIDS o have only tapped into 2% of that, despite them being uh, the country groups that are probably uh, most in need of, of adaptation. So um, specifically for myself, that's kind of where I've been focusing my efforts to say that um, access to finance is key and um, I, yeah, making it fit for uh, small islands rather than uh, I think what's happened in the past is there's a, an application that's the same for everyone and then we're using processes that when you have a, a climate team that's five people, they, mm. it's very challenging to meet those. So I think the Global Environmental Facility, for example, they have a SIDS window or a mm. SIDS envelope. Um, and that's worked really well for small islands because uh, we don't have to meet these huge hurdles in order to access that uh, financing. So getting some good examples and also sharing it with the other institutions to say, well, we hear you, but if you actually look at the things that are on the ground, this is the stuff that's working, so perhaps we can try to replicate those. So um, I think that's probably where I, I personally focus my efforts on. No, thank you. I actually, if I can stay with you just for a moment uh, longer, we, the, the issue of uh, climate finance and more importantly, accessible to the climate finance has come up, I think, in almost e every edition of the Islands Dialogue. I think it's one of the uh, aspects that's uh, brought up. Um, can I ask you to maybe uh, say in your role, because in your efforts, are there very specific challenges that you're facing or specific issues that you would like maybe the US audience or even the bank and the it, uh, multilateral institutions and financing uh, uh, agencies to be aware of on this that can be uh, on the restructuring aspect of it. So if there were specific examples and maybe we can use uh, the, our, the stakeholders that are coming to the table for this dialogue to facilitate that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So on climate finance specifically, and I, I just uh, yeah. stated it, so it's basically like I, I, the, the application hurdles need to be um, revised for SIDS um, so that they're better suited for, uh, you know, I, I say in Palau, we probably have like three statisticians. And that's actually a hurdle that a lot of large countries don't understand. I was talking to the UK and they said their economic um, 
division had 20,000 people, and that is the size of my country. So I think you can imagine um, may, people, small island developing states, they don't actually realize how small we mm -hmm. actually are. And so having communicating that to them to say, you know, if, if a team is very small and if they don't have these capabilities, perhaps we need to change the application rather mm -hmm. than um, flying in consultants and having them create all this data. So that's one. Um, on uh, graduation, I, Margo and myself are, are kind of uh, unique in the sense that we are, uh, we, uh, Palau has graduated to high income, so we were not eligible for um, ODA and concessional financing. This happened right as COVID hit. Mm. So that was a really challenging thing for us where, um, because it's based on historical uh, GNI per capita, when COVID hit, we closed our economy, which in some years, um, tourism makes up 50% of the GDP. Um, and we couldn't access concessional financing or ODA because we have now graduated according to um, the OECD DAC requirements. So that's one of the things we're also working on is could we change those parameters so perhaps it's not just historical, but if you're forecasting that you're gonna lose a lot of revenue for a, an external shock or a typhoon or a, something else, perhaps we can look at forecast um, measures as well to evaluate um, graduation. And also maybe we could use like a, a more gradual graduation process, because right now it just basically, it's like a fiscal cliff. You have access to all this stuff and then all of a sudden one day somebody decides you're rich and then you have no financing. and um, for small islands, it's challenging because we can't access private capital markets. We can't, uh, it's very hard for us to raise bonds because we're very small. Uh, we also, um, we, some of our countries, Palau, we use the US dollar, so mm -hmm. we can't print money. So our access to finance more broadly is very different from you know, Indonesia or in a different developing country. So I, we're, yeah, I think within the international finance system, we're, we're trying to get those points across. Um, because sometimes people just don't realize, like we're very small, but we're also very different. So the uh, we have to create solutions that are well, fit, fit for fit for purpose. Thank you, thank you so much, Ambassador. That was that was fantastic, um, Ambassador Margo. If I can turn to you on the same question in terms of uh, the multilateral uh, institutions and negotiations, and in your uh, uh, view and in your role, um, specific areas that you think requires attention to start delivering on some of these issues uh, within the system that we have today. Thank you, Dashana. Maybe just a point to come back to on the first question, really the reality, because I did raise one specific issue with this climate insecurity. And I just wanted to ca canvas that the point of having geopolitical attention in the region is hopefully focusing, and the added advantage would be to uh, have partners to focus on what is really needed by the Pacific in our region. And climate insecurity is one, but I wanted to add to my colleague um, Mbase Lana's comments regarding finance, because I think uh, it's, it's, it's really one of the pillars that is really required for us to move any, any is access to it, either climate finance or either development finance. And also these adaptation with realities to what we're experiencing today. And if I, if I may just quote what Secretary Guterres has said, is that the international finance, and finance system is short-sighted, crisis-prone, and there no relation to the economic reality of today. And I think this, this is something that needs to resonate in terms of addressing small states, and I mean micro-states. So my country has 11,000 people. And as rightfully highlighted, but we don't have access, we have been put on the OECD DAC to be graduating to a high income, just straight off the pandemic, which makes no sense. So these, and um, we're not in that, I mean, not to have access to finance to help us and be in a position to address or combat the scale of climate, cri the climate crisis that we're facing is, is, is ridiculous. So I just wanted to, to kind of highlights that real point of how important the financing is, be it um, climate development or, or uh, ODA, since Monaro is still struggling uh, with the fact that we are supposed to be graduating as a high income and may not be accessible to any development finance. Um, 
from partners. And this is really based on the GDP GNI system that um, Ilana raised. And I, I think there needs, I mean, we, we support a reform, which, which, is, which is not happening, but this is something that needs to be addressed in, in all areas when you start thinking about the small states, mm. the vulnerable states, and also especially in our region. And um, I think there was a suggestion, and I think it's been put forward, the multi-vulnerability multi dimension, dimension, oh, multi dimension vulnerability index that has been put forward by the UN, um, the United Nations, to consider how to, how to um, evaluate your vulnerabilities as opposed to today's reality. Uh, in terms of your development index. So this 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 tool that's being developed by the United Nations for Nauru is a really practical one and we we can see it would it can provide a potential to truly measure our development status and the, the requirement that we need in terms of truly reflecting our development. So this is something that is some uh, Nauru would support as we go through the international system, the United Nations system, and we hope that it goes through and be supported by the member states. So this is one of the, the key elements that I wanted to raise on, on, on that point. But as I said, any opportunities being raised as a platform beyond the geopolitical uh, or being a focus of the geopolitics, you can either bring your the opportunities to help us address the real immediate needs that we're these these countries face or and be your true partner. I, I think that's really the message. And climate and security is one other element which I raised earlier in your in your question as one of those uh, key ones that we need the United Nations and all to understand that climate change does pose a security has security implications to our existence as states, countries and people, islands and people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to remind our um, audience that if, uh, whether in person or online, uh, a lot of us write about geopolitics, a lot of us talk about geopolitics, and we have begun to talk a lot about islands. If you have specific questions to the ambassadors on any of the points they have raised, this is really the moment to ask them and take advantage of it. And also, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, break out of the narratives of dominant literature that comes out from one side of the uh, uh, world. Um, uh, let me turn to you both for uh, f uh, on, on sort of the Blue Pacific strategy and uh, SG Puna in the morning did speak about it. So, um, and you have, and the US Pacific Island Summit is, is coming up. What do you expect partners? It's been one year since the last summit and you know, there've been a series of um, initiatives that have been announced in this summit. Would, what do you expect partners of the Pacific to deliver on the priorities of the strategy? Um, I think, well, I, I think Margo might be in a better position to, to answer that since she's also the ambassador to the United States. So um, she participates in that summit, but I, I can kind of speak to it. So we, we recently had um, uh, preparatory meetings for the SIDS conference. So with respect to the Pacific, I think working with partners, um, I think finance is, is always something that's come up. Um, access to uh, for access to finance, quality finance, um, and um, predictable finance, I think it was one of the things, um, so that we can implement our, uh, our, um, our plans. I think that was one key. Um, and partnerships, I think working not just with government, but also with private sector, with technology, with civil service and youth and indigenous groups. So to try to bring more stakeholders to solve the challenges that we're uh, currently working on was kind of another key theme for um, uh, what we wanted to do as the Pacific. Um, the third is data was also a key thing that kept coming up. Um, it's really hard to, um, to manage what you don't measure. So I think that was one of the things that in the Pacific uh, uh, preparatory meeting, we were calling on partners to help us develop um, robust data systems so that we can kind of track our progress. Um, and I think the, um, I'd say I, the, the final one, it was also kind of revolving around culture and how do we create progress with by still respecting our, our kind of Pacific identities and our culture and 
um, this phrase, the Pacific way, which um, hopefully um, uh, we can kind of work together rather than uh, against competing interests. So I think I'll just end uh, with that specifically, but it may, may relate to uh, the summit coming, coming up. Yeah, thank you. Ambassador Margo, on the upcoming summit order um, and the Blue, Best, Blue Pacific strategy. So on, on that point, um, Tashana, the, the U.S., the United States, relations with the Pacific Islands forum countries has been, if, if I may put it nicely, late in the game or <laughs> late, but they're making up. It's been 37 years since the first, since the visit, I think, or the first visit of Secretary Blinken again, back official. Uh, and then we had the first summit. Can you hear me? I don't know. If yes, yes, I'm... absolutely. We can hear you. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of, um, uh, if I may say, frankly, a, a makeup between the U.S. not being in our region and then their interest becoming more geopolitically focused, as, as you rightfully highlighted at the beginning. And so we're now on our second summit. Now, in terms of uh, commitments, the summit commitments are right there in uh, different re subregions, probably have more than other regions, but we're all working towards the goal of uh, strengthening partnerships across the region and those priority areas, which are mostly uh, security, uh, maritime, um, and also climate change. In terms of realizing any benefits at this stage, uh, I think it's too early for me to comment, but then maybe that's my personal view. Uh, we're still working around, um, I guess, the, the commitments and working through. Uh, it's been only the second year, and I think the proposed time for this regular meetings between the Pacific and the and the U.S. Uh, administration is to be every two years from now on. I I haven't seen. I mean. The, the the discussion, the open forum, the commitment by the U.S. by employing, having special envoys on the ground, um, um, strengthening, opening embassies across the Pacific in, in areas they used to have or reopening in some areas are, are right there. I just, for me personally, we haven't really seen that full commitment for Nauru as a partner to, to the U.S. So... If, if if I can say, I cannot say it's successful. I say it's in work in progress. And I think uh, we're still working out in terms of, but regionally across the region, I think there's the focus as, as uh, the U.S. focus is in the Pacific uh, based on, on their commitments are raised. So. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Margo. Um, we have about 10 minutes in uh, just turn to some of the questions that have come in from the audience, both uh, uh, here in, in person and online. Um, I think the first question is, uh, and it's addressed to both of you, so um, how helpful are multilateral institutions like the United Nations for small island states, particularly when other nations have veto power? So um, <laughs> <laughs> either of you are welcome to take uh, the question, or both of you. Uh, I'm, I'm happy yeah. to take a crack at that question. Um, so multilateralism is, I think it has its time and place. Um, it, a lot of people are frustrated that it doesn't quite deliver uh, and it doesn't deliver quickly. However, I will say, so I've only been um, ambassador for two years and I've seen that the UNFCCC process, for example, that's delivered um, and is starting to deliver on kind of climate ambition, which... Um, so we had the Paris Agreement, we had four failed COPs, and then I uh, was a negotiator in Glasgow um, where we uh, got to strike a deal. Then we had the Charm um, COP, was, which was also successful. Um, and then, for example, the Biden administration passed the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, and that released like billions of dollars um, into the green space. Mm -hmm. The private sector then kind of put more money into it because um, government had de-risked uh, the, the green space. And I think it was maybe a month ago, um, there was a report saying that there was the most growth in green jobs um, in, the, you know, in the history of the United States. And I think that's what a green transition means. 
I think the UNFCCC um, was instrumental in delivering this. So, uh, I, you know, I think the cog is large and it turns slowly, but I do think that multilateralism, especially for things like climate, um, is essential because I don't really see any other way that we can work together globally without them. So I think there are, you know, frustrations um, that you do need consensus, for example, in that. So any country can veto it, but in some ways, then you're forced to kind of hear each other out. Um, and so when you do get a deal, then hopefully things um, start to move. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if a veto is a good thing or a bad thing. It's the thing that we're stuck with, so you kind of have to work around it. But um, I know Margot focuses on climate insecurity, so she probably has a whole bunch of thoughts on, on that. So I'll, I'll end, end with that. Thank you. Ambassador Margo. Thank you, Tashana. As said, um, how my experience with a veto is a negative one, depending on who, where you sit. Um, and for the Security Council, I had that because it was on a climate security, climate and security resolution that we really wanted to raise. And it has been an ongoing thing since our establishment of the, of the group since 2018. And that is to raise awareness very at the very top echelon of the decision making of the United Nations system, which is the Security Council to discuss international peace and security. From our perspective, climate change is a international and peace and security issue that needs to be discussed because of potential impacts like migration, displacement, moving people, and then uh, the United Nations needs to address that. However, other nations don't feel the same uh, as we do. And so the historic uh, resolution on the, the United Nations Security Council resolution on climate-related security risk um, in conflict prevention strategies on 13th of June 2021 was vetoed by one country, but it was uh, co-sponsored or sponsored by 113 UN member states. So for me, that was a negative impact because it did not seek to address the issues that we were trying to raise and trying to advocate um, and support for that the United Nations or the system itself should now try to address these implications or these impacts that really do have and will affect the future of peoples across the world. Thank you, Ambassador. There are quite a few uh, questions coming in. Uh, we have about five minutes, but there's a question on private sector. Uh, uh, what has the role of the private sector been in climate and development financing, and do you see future opportunities for additional or more effective engagement? Um, again, either of you or both of you, which I think it's a, to the panel. That one is a it's a bit of a tricky question because the uh, the the, sh the short answer is I, I actually don't know um, because we focus mostly on public sector finance. However, just like I said, what what we saw with the Inf Inflation Reduction Act is that that bill is over three hundred billion dollars. Um, a lot of it to green the, the green sector. And, and what happens when government sends that signal is that the private investors then think that the space has been de-risked. So then they start putting money into the sector as well as investment. So I actually, I went to, it was the last, last Unga, I went to a dinner that was hosted by the private sector and they were just, there was so much money in the space and they were trying really hard to hire people. Um, and so I think, I don't know, in exact figures, but that's kind of the way things work, where government sets the direction, it puts money to de-risk a space, the private sector then comes in to try to make a return on that investment. Um, so I can't tell you exact figures, but I think that, you know, government's kind of the catalyst and hopefully private sector follows. Uh, development finance, I think it depends on the country. So, um, you know, a lot of the Pacific will look for foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, if, if it it's kind of goes hand in hand, if a country is constantly getting destroyed by a hurricane every other month, it's really hard to attract foreign direct investment. So I think the government's working together to solve some of those um, kind of risks, de-risking uh, investment will also allow the private funds to come in. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Margo, any thoughts on private sector and climate financing? 
Well, coming from a small micro state, we we as uh, rightfully say we it's really hard for us to attract any foreign direct investment. We don't have that credit worthiness to be able to uh, hold such loans. So it's 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 really it's really well it's difficult for me to say in terms of, but I, I just know that it is really governments can be catalysts, but we also have. Uh, uh, issues to face with when we're talking about uh, credit worthiness, uh, all those banking details that that needs because we also don't have our own currency, so this is also difficult for eleven thousand people. It's really hard to hold currency. We have banking difficulties, so the the all these work against us in this system where we're trying to uh, access concessional financing, be able to to show. Uh, we require support, but also require some investment. But I, I think I, I'm not going to be labels. I'm not an expert, but I know that credit worthiness is also something that goes against this micro, micro state, especially in this kind of system, uh, the global financial system. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Um, just a final question to to both of you. On I think uh, particularly to you, Ambassador Liana. Um, because as you mentioned, the draining of resources in case of increasing interest in the region. Um, how do you envision the climate cooperation amid the geopolitical competition between different players like China, US, Australia? Uh, do you see a perspective of regional climate uh, uh, club creation to focus narrowly on incoming requests uh, and suggestions from other countries and work collaboratively on the problem? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? It was time? a long, yeah. long question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So basically, it just uh, the question is: um, How do you do? You see? Uh, do you envision uh, any sort of cooperation coming out of this geopolitical competition between China, Australia, and ASEAN, on, amongst I think the PIF uh, Pacific Island nations to uh, uh, leverage the conversation on climate and to narrowly focus on incoming requests and suggestions? I think it's borrowing from. What your remarks, mm -hmm. which uh, essentially said that there's so many requests coming in to yeah. filter through, and but despite that they are on opposing sides, maybe sometimes do you see a regional hub to manage that? Um, I think a, I don't know about a regional hub. I think uh, there are some examples that we work uh, through here at the UN. So we actually have a um, a joint committee with Italy that focuses on uh, uh, renewable energy. So. I think it's Italy, Austria, Spain. Um, they've created this kind of climate fund for the Pacific Islands, and we work. Uh, so the the Pacific Islands can submit project proposals, um, and that's kind of a way where they everything's kind of centralized. Um, but yeah, it it seems to be that that happens a lot at the UN, where kind of like-minded or friendly countries will come together to pool resources and try to. Um, address things. I know South Africa, Brazil, and India also have a fund. Um, so there are circumstances or in instances where those already exist, um, but it's typically kind of countries that already get along that are um, kind of come up with a, a program and then they, they work either with the Pacific SIDS or with the Pacific Island Forum. Um, and then kind of, so there, yeah, there is some centralization. Um, yeah, I, I think that will probably continue. Um, there has been, as I said in the beginning, where there are a lot more kind of uh, bilateral visits, and they, I think we need to kind of try to figure out together how we uh, centralize some of these things, because it definitely gets where, um, you know, one, one country is trying to donate solar panels, and then another country is um, doing the same, and they don't kind of speak to each other. So there, there probably needs to be a lot more work done on that. But I, I don't think that there's um, any conversations around that currently. Yeah. Ambassador Margo, any thoughts on that uh, question on regional climate uh, uh, cooperation to manage the different requests and offers coming through? I mean, as Il Ambassador Ilana raised, I think we have existing regional agencies and crop agencies in our region that helps us manage some of these um, capacity difficulties or capacity limitations by the region itself. Uh, we have this uh, SPREP and we have, uh, I'm just putting the acronyms, I've got the whole full name, but uh, 
they do deal with some of how some of these coordination and links can help the Pacific, especially when we have capacity issues. Um, but if we're talking about partners, we also have some existing regional cooperation amongst partners who also cooperate to help certain regional factors. So they're, they're there. I guess the question is, is it enough at this time? I, I don't think so. Uh, I think there needs to be more. But the managing part of it is how how our countries, because uh, small island developing states and uh, have been known to have absorptive capacity limitations. So these are some of the things that deals with more of the the the, the national institution and domestic uh, uh, issues themselves. But trying to get them across, trying to move them, a lot of these. Uh, resources or support would be very, very helpful. But I think the institutions are there. Exist, There are existing ones, but they just need to be strengthened and more focused, I guess. Um, that would be my comment on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Vasa. Any final concluding thoughts or remarks you wanted to share with, uh, with the audience, with us today, uh, before we close the panel? Ambassador Margo, if you uh, wanted to share anything as concluding thought uh, on this? conversation today so like just a just a few points I, I didn't want to make it so negative that United Nations doesn't work it just needs to be <laughs> <laughs> for purpose I just realized that I I must have uh, thrown it off that multilateralism doesn't really work I want to rephrase that I don't want anyone to take that away for small states multilateralism is important it, it's an important platform mm -hmm. and rules-based international order can be very advantageous for small states that are, are securing their own sovereignty, trying to solve global problems that are issue solution, find solutions that are beyond our national borders. And so these these can very much help us. And I wanted to, I, I mean, I raised just one point from a Security Council perspective of how uh, we're one of those supporters who want the Security Council to reform. but reform for the best, for the better, to, to meet today's global challenges. But I, I didn't raise the points that there are some really good things about multilateralism, and one of them is the recent adoption, well, the not signing in, but the recent adoption of the BBNJ Treaty. So I just wanted to mention that the that there are there are some good things <laughs> there uh, in the multilateralism world. It's just how how to make it fit for purpose and for today's challenges is really one of the things that I that I want I want the message to carry on because some of some countries like mine, like Nauru, will always miss out because of our small state and it should not be treated like that. We should be part of um, the solution or part of the issue especially when we're member states. So I just wanted to raise that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm certain you're not alone in your uh, sentiments <laughs> towards UN and multilateralism. Uh, uh, even even the staunchest supporters of it would probably at some point agree with you. Ambassador, you know, uh, Yeah, no, I, I agree with Margaret. I think, you know, the, uh, the, the UN is a, I think it's a, an idealistic place. I think the world is better uh, that we have it. But it is also an organization that is is quite old, and um, we have to reform it to make it fit for purpose. Um, and that also includes like the Bretton Woods institutions, like the World Bank and the IMF. They were built in a different time mm -hmm. for a different world. Um, it's typically the developed countries that have the money that set the rules. But I think we have to kind of acknowledge that those rules don't work for all of us, including for small islands. So we have to be vocal about what we think uh, can work, and then we have to try to create solutions together. And I think that's one of the things that came out of our um, Pacific SIDS conference is that partnerships are a two-way street. It's mm -hmm. not one country setting, one country or group of countries that set the rule and then we should all follow them. We should actually have a dialogue about how do we actually solve the problem. So um, I think those are kind of the concluding thoughts, which is hope, and, and it seems to be, that was kind of the sentiment that we got in that SIDS conference meeting. Um, which the development partners seem to be listening to us now. Um, so how do we actually take the dialogue and move it towards implementation, um, I think is kind of where we're going. There's still a lot of work to do, but um, yeah, I think that's what I'd end with. 
Well, thank you. I think this is an excellent thought to end the panel on, on reform and UN as the world leaders are meeting at the United Nations right across uh, the street. So please join me in thanking the ambassadors for this conversation today. Thank you, Ambassador Margo. Thank you, Ambassador Lina, for joining us today. Uh, we'll break for lunch now, uh, and then we'll reconvene at 1.15 for a very exciting conversation on digital public infrastructure with UNDP and uh, the Director of Carnegie India. See you then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.